Hello everyone. Today I am going to tell you how to approach a case of lymphadenopathy in children. So today you will learn how to examine for the lymph nodes, then definition of lymphadenopathy, then how to approach a case, then difference between significant and non-significant lymphadenopathy, then what are the various causes of localized and generalized lymphadenopathy. Now the examination of lymph node, we have to palpate the cervical, axillary and inguinal lymph node for the lymphadenopathy. So we have to start from the submental, then submandibular and then preauricular lymph nodes in front of the ear we should palpate. Then post auricular lymph node in this video I am palpating post auricular. Now the occipital lymph node at the base of skull. Now this is superficial anterior cervical lymph node in front of sternocleidomastoid and the posterior cervical just behind the sternocleido. Now the supraclavicular lymph node here we have to palpate. Now axillary lymph node so anterior axillary lateral axillary lymph node and then medial axillary lymph node should be palpated and then apical axillary in the apex of then posterior axillary lymph node. Now in this image you can see these are the various cervical lymph nodes. Whenever there is a swelling or enlargement of lymph nodes we label as a lymphadenopathy. We should also remember that between 4 to 8 years of age group lymphoid growth occur. So during this duration in 90% children, cervical lymph nodes will be palpable but non-significant. Not having any significant lymphadenopathy during this duration. Then we will label as a physiological lymphoid growth. Now how to approach? Whenever you are examining for the lymphadenopathy, lymph nodes are palpable. Then you have to differentiate is it localized lymphadenopathy or generalized. Whenever two or more than two lymph nodes area non-contiguous enlarged then we label as a generalized lymphadenopathy otherwise we label as a localized. Once you differentiate between these two then you have to check the size of the lymph nodes, its consistency, surface, tenderness is there or not, are the lymph nodes discrete or matted? mobile or fixed to the underlying tissue, color and the overlying scheme changes example erythema or any fistula sinus formation, anything is there or not. According to all these features, we have to label either significant lymphadenopathy or non-significant lymphadenopathy. Now the difference between significant and non-significant lymphadenopathy. So according to the size, consistency, surface, are discrete or mated, mobile or fixed, overlying skin and tenderness. We have to differentiate the lymph nodes are either pathological lymphadenopathy or non-pathological or physiological or non-significant conditions are there. So we label as a significant lymphadenopathy whenever cervical and axillary lymph nodes are more than 1 cm in size. Inguinal lymph node more than 1.5 cm we considered as a significant. Supraclavicular and epitrochlear lymph nodes if palpable they are always pathological. So even less than 0.5 cm we considered as a pathological. While the non-significant lymph nodes are less than 1 cm in size they are shorty, scattered, small nodes feel like short gunpialite. Now check the consistency. Consistency in pathological condition, it is rubbery, firm or hard lymph nodes, sometimes soft also. But in non-significant, it is relatively soft. Now check the surface. Surface rough in significant lymphadenopathy, is smooth in non-significant. Now check are the lymph nodes discrete or mated. Mated lymph nodes seen in malignancy and tuberculosis. While in non-significant lymphadenopathy, lymph nodes will be discrete. Now check the are the lymph node mobile or fixed to the underlying structure. So fixed lymph node seen in malignancy and tuberculosis. 
while freely movable nodes seen in non pathological non significant overlying skin erythema warm skin will be seen whenever there is a lymphadenitis any infection or inflammation is there while the normal skin present in non significant check for the tenderness so non significant lymphadenopathy always non tender while in the significant lymphadenopathy tenderness can be present because of inflammatory process in the lymphadenitis or sometime hemorrhage into the necrotic center of the malignant node but it is not compulsory that tenderness will be present in all significant lymphadenopathy even in malignancy non tender lymph nodes are more common than the tender lymph nodes only whenever there is a hemorrhage into the uh, necrotic center then only tenderness will be present in malignant otherwise in malignancy non tender lymph nodes present so i will tell you the various causes of significant lymphadenopathy so in non significant lymphadenopathy example if the patient is having the age group between 4 to 8 years normal age for the lymphoid growth or sometime because of lice infestation or sometime because of the immune response after vaccination also patient can develop the non significant lymphadenopathy in which we are not supposed to go for the uh, further investigations we have to do the proper counseling because resolve by 3 to 6 month now the further step after labeling are the significant and non significant if you find it is significant then you have to find out the etiology either infection or autoimmune disorder or malignancy then check the onset and progression of the lymphadenopathy according to this we have to label either acute lymphadenopathy or subacute lymphadenopathy or chronic lymphadenopathy always take thorough history do the proper physical examination because other signs and other systemic examination will give you the clue about the various conditions now the causes of localized and generalized lymphadenopathy so we should remember that in localized lymphadenopathy in rubella posterior auricular lymph nodes will be enlarged in ocular glandular syndrome in trichoma epidemic keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis adenovirus type 3 pharyngo conjunctival fever anterior auricular lymph nodes will be enlarged if patient is having oropharyngeal or dental infection then unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy will be there if patient is having tuberculosis coccidiomycosis fungal infection epstein barr virus infection infectious mononucleosis toxoplasmosis sarcoidosis in malignancy lymphoma leukemia in such case bilateral cervical lymph nodes will be enlarged supraclavicular adenopathy is suggesting that patient is having primary malignancy either in the abdomen or in chest epitrochlear lymph nodes enlarged due to secondary infections in hand and Pura. Inguinal lymphadenopathy seen with the syphilis, chancroid, lymphogranuloma venerum. Unilateral lymphadenopathy of extremities with exposure to cats. If history is suggesting that they are having exposure to cats, then we should suspect cat scratch fever also. Now, in generalized lymphadenopathy, we should think that. may be infections or autoimmune disorder or malignancy or storage disorder so in infection which lead to the generalized lymphadenopathy are tuberculosis hiv brucellosis infectious mononucleosis infectious mononucleosis can cause the localized or generalized both hepatitis some fungal infections toxoplasmosis cmv typhoid fever syphilis plague all will lead to the generalized lymphadenopathy autoimmune disorder example juvenile rheumatoid arthritis sle sarcoidosis in such condition patient may have generalized lymphadenopathy in malignancy we know acute leukemia lymphoma both hodgkin non hodgkin will lead to the generalized lymphadenopathy storage disorder gaucher neeman pig can lead to the generalized lymphadenopathy 
some endocrine disorder grave disease addition disease can lead to the generalized lymphadenopathy some chronic dermatological conditions example eczema can lead to the generalized lymphadenopathy if in history you find that exposure to some toxins or the drugs example allopurinol etinolol captopril anticonvulsant phenytoin carbamazepine antibiotics cephalosporin penicillin quinidine sulfonamide can lead to generalized lymphadenopathy if patient is having enlargement of ap trochlear axillary and supraclavicular nodes then possibility of kate is crash fever if there is a history of exposure to kate is also then according to the onset and progression of the lymphadenopathy we have to label either acute or sub acute or chronic lymphadenopathy and history and physical examination also give us clue about the etiology so according to the onset example in cervical lymphadenopathy if patient is having acute onset and lymphadenopathy persists less than 2 weeks we label as a acute cervical lymphadenopathy it can be seen in the viral infection when the patient is having the viral prodrome lymph nodes are tender on palpation either unilateral or bilateral and resolve within 2 to 4 weeks it is the most common cause of acute cervical lymphadenopathy in children viral infection bacterial infections can also lead to the cervical lymphadenitis example staphylococcus streptococci group a and group b but bacterial lymphadenitis usually unilateral it is present in entire part of neck also lymph nodes are firm and tender patient will have the overlying skin changes erythema warm also limited neck motions and fever and swelling will be there sometime because of deep head and neck infection in example in retropharyngeal abscess patient will have the cervical lymphadenitis cervical lymphadenopathy unilateral and tender also present in kawasaki disease if lymph nodes are enlarged beyond 2 weeks we label as a sub acute it is also commonly seen in the viral infection chronic persistent cervical lymphadenopathy when it is beyond 6 weeks always we have to go for further investigations example viruses cmv epstein barr rubella can lead to this leukemia lymphoma autoimmune disorder sle gie chronic infection mycobacterium tuberculosis even eczema can lead to the persistent cervical lymphadenopathy now according to the history and physical examination if you find patient is having fever sore throat and localizing symptoms pain in the tonsil or pharynx or uh, teeth so example in pharyngitis tonsillitis dental infection patient will have the cervical lymphadenopathy with these symptoms if generalized lymphadenopathy with sore throat fatigue fever exudative tonsillitis even hepatosplenomegaly then epstein barr virus infection infectious mononucleosis can lead to this so for this we have to go for the antibody titer to confirm the diagnosis if patient is having fever of more than 5 days duration with rashes and bilateral no suppurative conjunctivitis erythema of lips tongue strawberry tongue erythema or swelling of hands feet with cervical unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy then possibility of kawasaki disease if patient is fit into this criteria for the kd then we can make the diagnosis if patient is having weight loss anorexia evening rise of temperature and history of contact is also there with the uh, tuberculosis then we can go for the investigation to rule out the tuberculosis if there is a history of recurrent infections recurrent skin abscess recurrent lymphadenopathy then rule out the immunodeficiency disorder either primary or secondary example in hiv as a drug history including the treatment with the antibiotics or anticonvulsant so drug induced lymphadenopathy we can rule out 
if there is exposure to animals then zoonotic disease example brucellosis in which patient will have the lymphadenopathy uh, fever hepatosplenomegaly if there is a history of scratch or bite of a cat then we should rule out the cat scratch disease bartonella and cell infection if patient is having chronic cervical lymphadenopathy with weight loss patechi paler bone pain hepatosplenomegaly then rule out the malignancy leukemia lymphoma neuroblastoma rhabdomyosarcoma can be the possibility if patient is having chronic generalized lymphadenopathy with rashes with arthritis then autoimmune diseases example slegi so this is all about the lymphadenopathy thank you so much